ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, uh, welcome. Um, we appreciate you coming on a rainy afternoon with all sorts of measures uh, in place, but we really appreciate you coming and it's a full house today as you can see with a, a waiting list all interested in the conversation that we'll be having uh, as a group today with uh, Professor Tong Chai Winishakul. Um, he requires no introduction, but we will be providing him with, <laughs> with one. Um, but I'll, first I just want to say on behalf um, of the Mainland Southeast Asian Studies Group which are, of uh, Asia Research Institute, um, I'm Mai Triang Thuyen, co-convener with uh, uh, Dr. Titima. Um, and we have came across this idea to start this, um, start this talk series as a way of looking beyond just the scholarship um, that's been produced uh, within the field, but to get to the stories, the personal stories of the scholars and the institutions and the context in which much of the scholarship that we all um, are, have a access to, um, have a, a connection to that context. And um, this series was an attempt to, to start off uh, this type of series of conversations with, with scholars in the field. And the idea of pillars of the, of the field was twofold. One, to suggest that scholars um, and eminent figures uh, like Professor Tong Chai um, are themselves pillars, but it was also the ideas that they, they uh, offered as well as their own service to the field also served to, to create a very important foundation uh, for fields like Southeast Asian Studies um, and the various disciplines that were affiliated to it. Um, and so this was the idea, and this comes, behind, comes fr uh, on the trail of other sorts of projects that some of you may be already familiar with. Nick Tarling had a book called Historians and Their Disciplines, which is a really wonderful s series of biographies, similar to what hopefully this conversation will be. Um, our, our colleague Gobing Long also had a project with Department of Southeast Asian Studies that did similar things. Um, and David Stanson's book on the politics of knowledge and looking at area studies also had semi-biographical um, surveys of the field. And so it's in this spirit that uh, we might try to continue on this, these types of discussions, but um, also thinking about where we are um, in this broader story of, of knowledge production. As you all know, uh, Tong Chai, the scholar, um, is very well uh, known to us through his, through his role, um, both as a professor of Asian studies and history um, from the Un uh, University of Wisconsin. Emer he's an emeritus professor. Um, he has also led the field um, beyond Southeast Asia and Thai studies um, um, as president of the Association um, of Asian Studies. He was um, inducted into the American Academy of Arts uh, and Sciences. He's a Guggenheim Award re recipient, and his book, of course, that many of you all uh, have read um, was a Benda Prize uh, winner. He has served on a number of editorial boards um, for, for journals that are crucial to our field, like Modern Asian Studies, um, Southeast Asian Research, and he's published uh, in many journals, including our own Journal of Southeast Asian Studies, Journal of Asian Studies, and so forth. And so what we see is this is the face that, and person that many of us know. But for those in Thai scholars uh, in Thai studies, we'll also know that there are other faces and, and images of, of Tong Chai uh, and roles that he still also plays. Of course, there's the story of him uh, his, in his formation um, as a student activist. And perhaps these are some of the ideas um, we might be talking about uh, today. And also, perhaps more recently, his also role as a public intellectual. Um, his continuing um, interest in being um, a figure within Thai discussions. And what's important to know um, is while his, his English language scholarship um, is obviously well known to us, not many of us perhaps know that he's also written seven other books in Thai and a number of articles. And so this sort of duality of being a part of an English language scholarly community as well as a Thai scholarly community is one that um, is interesting for many scholars, uh, for many scholars in the field. And so perhaps we might even start off um, from th that point. And I just want to say that I will probably have a conversation for about 30 minutes or so to 40 minutes, and then we'll leave the rest of the conversation up to you. Um, and we'd encourage you all to use uh, the mics and, um, and participate in, uh, in this as, as, as well. But as I suggested, um, 
there are many sides in the sense of, of, uh, of, of your career and your role as a person. And I was wondering, I mean, do you find yourself adjusting, you know, to the different audiences and to the, the, different, the different contexts in which you are operating as a, as a scholar or as a public intellectual? Do you see yourself, in a sense, um, thinking and speaking differently in a place like Ari uh, or in Wisconsin, or as you might as when you are in Chiang Mai or, or Bangkok? Maybe it's a natural uh, adjustment. Uh, I just my English is still not quite English, and uh, in conversation it's easier to to communicate. In writing, the editors know that I my English is not proper English, so. Like uh, my advisor used to say that I can write English in such a way because I'm not a native speaker. So it's a kind of unique, I don't know how unique, but he said that it's kind. Then one day, this many years ago, I asked my editor at the Hawaii Press, is it true? She said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so at it, 20 years, 20 something years ago, when she helped me edit the, the book, she said that. Uh, she took the task by herself because the first editor she asked kind of headache how to how to edit my English. So and then she, she managed to create a kind of system that she detect a frequent, strange, a frequent, I mean, even grammatically correct, but it's not the way they, you do, you write in English. <laughs> So she asked me the question, the question, and you think about 20 something years ago, there's no email, right? It's all posted. It's all posted, this kind of question. That's how. So to answer this, because naturally I adjust, not adjust to, to become a kind of native, fluent native speaker or writer, no, but I adjust to the audience. When you ask, I don't know what I need to adjust, but I do. Uh, not just politically, to some extent politically is, is you know, Thai. You know, if you, you know some more about my background, I always uh, kind of uh, critical to the monarchy, critical to the, the court word always come out automatically. Or I would say <clears throat> part of it is a thinking i thinking about the monarchy not as much as the person. I always see the person as a, this is a kind of backing, uh, this event anyway. Uh, uh, before Duncan McCargo talking about network mon monarchy, I, I often think about the monarchy as a person within a broader, I didn't use the word network, but broader thing anyway. So many times when I talk about the monarchy, I talk about it in plural, automatically, not because I want to avoid trouble. It's, it's a way to think. Or I talk about it as not as one person. So that's how I, in Thai, I can avoid trouble. Not always, no, but let's say it's easier. E easier because that, that's, the way, that's the way I think, that's the way I adjust. In English, I found that even though it's not native speak, it's not my mother tongue. Nowadays, I'm not sure when it started. I have no idea. I express my ideas better. In Thai, it's so clumsy. It's so hard. I find many words in English easier to quick coming out and, 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 and. Uh, somebody told me, the change must be the time when I start dreaming in English. <laughs> then I don't know when I start dreaming in English because now I'm, I'm still dreaming bilingually. <laughs> Perhaps we can take you back before you started dreaming into Eng in English, uh, back to your sort of formative years. Um, you were a, a student at uh, Tamasat um, and you were involved in, in activism and so forth. What drew you to this? Um, what were the, what was the feelings of the time that sort of drew you into this, this sense of uh, political action? Oh. Uh, 
I was an activist, the kind of activist that don't read books. Yeah, I don't read books. If I have any kind of uh, fortunate, fortunate background, is that I, I believe I'm a kind of good student. I, I did good in my grad school before turning activist. After that, I, since then, I stopped reading. <laughs> Uh, don't ask me anything about math because my math is ended at tenth grade. So, so were you always drawn to history or to geography? No, I mean, what's, no, what's, no. What like, did you like? I think, like it, most people, we hate history. <laughs> uh, not just Thai. I believe that his, most people in the world we hate history because history is boring. But. Uh, History is kind of a weird subject that we all hate history, but whenever there is a national controversy, everybody claims to know history very good. <laughs> I was activist. I didn't read much book. Full-time activist. I didn't go to class. I may be lucky. I, again, maybe background, good background of learning. I always got a good tutor, and I learned fast. I can get to university, <laughs> I can get great, uh, but actually I didn't pay much attention to, to reading, but I, I think I just may be lucky, just conceptualize, understand things uh, uh, quickly. Only when I, I was in prison for two years. Only, even in prison, I didn't read much because you, you're not allowed to read much. You're allowed to bring things in, such as six months after in prison, you start having Donald Duck. Yeah, you can have cartoons. Uh, you have cartoons for a while, then you can have a, a kind of more serious stuff, such as novel. And history stuff is always safe. So, yes, I first in touch with history more because that, that's a book they allow. Otherwise, I mean, pol political books, no way. Uh, but at, at the time, history is not fun. I read more novel than, novels than history. But uh, when I released from prison, that's the time that uh, nothing else to do because one of the things they expect, they mean the, the state. They, they released on, I mean, in my case, our case, got amnesty. A law passed to absolve the all kind of wrongdoing by whoever. They say that they absolve wrongdoing by us, but in fact, they already absolve wrongdoing by authorities. Everybody are free. But let's say on the condition of release, this is informal. Uh, we hope that they, they told us, you go back to school. At the time, if you know Thai history, a lot of friends go to, went to jungle. They told us, don't go to jungles because one, there are conflict within the authorities. We don't know for sure, but we can guess who, who, who support the amnesty, who didn't support the amnesty. To show to those who didn't support the amnesty that, uh, that we have to show, we have to perform that we are really not communist. <laughs> so to show that not com we are not communist, don't go to jungles, because if we go to jungles, we hurt everybody in our group. So what else to do? Reading books. <laughs> yeah, that's the time when they start reading books. And I think, again, unfortunately, reading books after spending years in activism and two years in jail, I, I, I found out that in my class, in history class, undergrad, I'm more mature. I did pretty good grades because it's easy. Easy to think, easy to compose, easy to, I mean, organize my thought. So in a way, if I was not arrested and studied through four years, maybe I got bad grades. <laughs> <laughs> so lucky that I, I returned to school after two years in prison. I, 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 I don't know why, but let's say I, it looked like every class seems easy, easier. Mm -hmm. Then I finished with good grades in history then not because I thought a lot about history, but because, but because rather because I didn't think much about it. So as a registered as history student before going to, to, to prison, so I can have lots of friends to help. Coming out, I didn't think much, so continue to history, 
get good grades, then starting finding jobs. While finding jobs, uh, in, I was encouraged to apply for, to do study more. Uh, at the time, again, I can try to find a job, but let's say a good, good, good option. Then it turned out I, I was rejected by everywhere I applied to the U.S., by the way. <laughs> so you decided to apply to go to graduate school? Yeah, yeah. Everywhere I applied to the U.S., I was rejected. And you ended up in Sydney? Because they, uh, they offer scholarship to me. <laughs> no other reason. What, what, uh, what sort of program did you enroll in in Sydney, and who were some history. of your professors? Oh, it was also history. in history. Were there particular professors that you enjoyed? Were there those that you didn't enjoy? At Presumably the time, they're not here in the audience. <laughs> at the time, I'm not sure even now, but now it should be better. Uh, I think I was similar to other undergrad students. I don't know much. I, my horizon is limited. I apply to the places where many of you know a gentleman, good supporter. I owe him a lot. Whatever Chan Chan told me to apply, I did. <laughs> because I have no idea what, what the difference between those places. I, I may have heard the name Ben Anderson because he wrote things, right? But I didn't read it in English. It's too difficult. A few things, right? <laughs> yeah, it's too difficult. But anyway, I applied to Cornell. I was rejected uh, because my TOEFL score is too low. I rejected everywhere. Australia is the only place where they offer the chance to, even I, I, I failed the first exam, they offered the chance to do again. And in Australia, I was told, John Chamwit put it, me, asked me to apply a number of places for different reasons. To Berkeley, not because he, he knows people, but not to particular people. To Cornell, because the program, there are people and it's a program which is great. To Sydney, because he asked, because he knows that Craig Reynolds is there. So you see, it's different reasons. Do you remember a favorite book or a, a favorite article, an idea that came during this formative period that was particularly inspiring to you to make you want to go on for a PhD? For a PhD, I have to say that no, I just because I didn't think much. Go along, especially out of prison, right? Out of prison, then I have just have in my mind, I don't want to do business. At the time, still anti-capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Just it almost like not automatic, but let's say options are limited. Option that I like. Uh, I already work as a research assistant to a professor at Tamasa, and then apply is kind of waiting. I already apply for a job as a proofreader in a publisher. I got a job, start, uh, start uh, working for a month before I know that I have a chance to get scholarship on the condition I pass English exam, which I fail. So I quit that job and to study English, prepare to go abroad. So any book in particular at that time, no. Interesting. <laughs> no, I don't have really particular book that I, uh, let's say I, I, I did well in history class. I, that time I read more, but let's say any particular book that I am impressed, not quite. It's one book in the first year before getting to prison, before October 6th massacre, that I did pretty well. <clears throat> that prompted me to register as a history student, partly because there are friends who study there. I don't have to go to class. They can. I can borrow their lectures. But partly because that book is Jit Pumisak, the real face of Thai feudal. I did finish that book. Not exactly because I'm a good student, because he's, he was a Marxist. And it's a book that most radical students know. So at least I finished that book. <laughs> not, because, not because of the class. But once the class assigned that book as one of the main reading, it's easier to me to answer that question, to answer the question to, without having to go to class. So again, fortunate. I, but in college, sorry, in grad school, that's the time when I, I read a lot. I have to say, even now, I see read English not quite. I know that how, 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 how fast Many of you can read English. 
because I have my colleagues at Wisconsin, I know how fast they can read. Oh, I can't do that even now. But uh, at first, it's the kind of not so confident I can, I can do the job. But over time, I think I'm more confident. I know there are many ways to do reading. I, I, I believe even now I read few numbers of books than my colleagues. Any conversation that involves, have you read this, have you read that, I avoid it. <laughs> because I, I didn't read a lot. But I believe I take different approach. I take a lot out of each reading. That's my approach. That's the only way to, to survive in that kind of environment where, oh, think about historians who native speakers, they read English fast. <laughs> I can read Thai fast. I kind of know how people scan the eyes. I know that they read English fast. I can do that in Thai, I can read English. So in grad school, that's the time that I read a lot. I have to say that in the end, what inspired me are two groups of books. This is not true for why I studied history, but at that time I studied history already. Because I went to grad school when disillusionment with the Communist Party, with the radical socialism, whatever, began to become widespread in the Thai text. So that prompted me to study a lot, to read a lot, Western Marxism, and to some point connect to Frankfurt School, then connect to Litkrit, those structuralism, post-structuralism area. This is one branch that I read a lot apart from my dissertation. Uh, I divide the time easily, half, 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 half a day for whatever I like to read. Half a day I do my, did my dissertation. And there, were, there was a five month period that I almost break up. I mean, I fed up with my dissertation. I didn't do anything with my dissertation. I finished, I mean, the whole time with reading something else. That's fun. Uh, the other group that uh, inspired me a lot, people may not know, and this give credit to Craig, to, to my advisor. He knows that I, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm fed up with kind of history. Can you share with your audience who your advisor was? Uh, Craig Reynolds, a uh, Thai specialist, Thai historian. He, he kind of, by that time he knows that I'm interested in things beyond dissertation. At least part of my time I want to, want that way. For Marxism, the part that I was influenced, or let's say a kind of gateway to help me a lot to understand is Perry Anderson, Western Marxism, which by now may be outdated, I don't know. The other one, which people may not know, but for me is a great book. Great book partly maybe, you know when you read books, some books influential more, some books influential less. Some classic book doesn't matter to you because it's interactive process, not just a book, it's due to, it's whoever you are having kind of matching right time. I was, I read, I, I learned a lot of from Martin J. Dialectical Imagination, Frankfurt School. Those two books are kind of basis that, that can branch out to others. The other side that I gave credit to Craig is that when he knew that I'm kind of fed up, don't want to do dissertation, he urged me to go to, uh, in Sydney, I was registered, I registered as Sydney University student, but I lived near the University of New South Wales. At New South Wales, there's a French historian teaching about Anau School. That's it. I read a lot of Anau School in English, not in French. I would say that the other day, there's a few people in Bangkok, I would just talk about art and, and my book. Western Marxism, late quick post-structuralism give me novel ideas I never thought of, fun to think. Anau School give me, inspire me to imagine. Imagine a lot, try to do something weird, try, and that's the way I learn about connection between history and art and other things. I'm not an artist, but wow, I just learned this is what art do. Because there are many an art school historian wrote like an artist. Your books I am mapped, of course, is very important for the field and won the Harry uh, Bender Prize. 
Um, in another interview that was, I think, conducted in 2016, with I think with the Bangkok Post, or maybe it was some other, I'm not sure actually what the citation was, but um, you mentioned that the book actually was a response to your experiences in October 6, 1976. I was wondering, that's very unusual because most people might think of this as a history of geography, of maps, of Thai identity, and so forth. I was wondering if you could share with us how that event and your participation in it um, affected the, how you wrote and how you thought about writing. It was in my mind the whole process that I want to do something for my friends who died. This never come out. It never, I mean, it's kept my mind it all the time. By that time, by the time I applied to study, I want to study formation of state, mode of production, blah, 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 blah. A few months later, everything turns dissolution. That's out. I learned through the process that I mentioned a moment ago. I, then it came out, I don't know when, how, I don't know. I just know that the interaction between those things, learn more about from Western Marxism, critical theory to post-structuralism. On the other hand, learn about another school to think differently, to think otherwise. Learn about those are to, 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 to try to take adventure. I want to write, tell me, you can tell me I'm, I'm over ambitious and when I was too young, I mean, of course, I didn't expect that I can do it, but it is, it, it's an in, it's an intention, whether or not I can do it, it doesn't matter. I want to write a new Thai history, full stop. I mean, nothing less than that. That in my mind from the, from the not from the start, but from the kind of disillusion. I don't want the answer that which strategy, which tactic to finish the revolution, I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore, it's Marxist, it's whatever, I don't care. I just want to write a new history because in my mind, history responsible for the massacre. History responsible for the death. Not only history, but history play an important part responsible for the death, for the killing. So history hurts people, history is murderers. So I want to write a history, and I want to write history in a way that partly because of influence I mentioned, playful. It's so, it should be powerful. That's my intention, whether or not I succeed, I don't know. Earlier you asked, I think about the audience. Normally when I write, I don't think about the audience. This is contrary to most, most advice, right? I don't think about the audience because I, Think too much is is a kind of burden to you how to write. I just want to write what I want to write, and whoever the audience just byproduct of it. I want just want to write a history that is so convincing, but is not powerful enough. It's hard to believe, convincing but hard to believe. So people would read it, would listen to it, but stop short or maybe kind of have a distance that no, it, it is too much to believe. And I think over the time, I think that's, that's the purpose of history. Just make us, make people think, that's all. To generate brain cells, that's all. No other purpose. It should not serve. One thing that I did over time, this is now school. Thanks to Brodell, thanks to many other people, I have this in mind, not theoretical at all, but let's say simple. Good history must be strange. Good history should be useless. <laughs> useless in the sense of a common word, maybe it's translated from Thai, cannot be used for political purposes, for whatever as ideology. It should have something Again, convincing, but at the same time, it's hard to believe, or let's say awkward, or something that people don't subscribe to it. 
History is too powerful. This is too powerful. You moved on from uh, from Sydney to the universe to, to back to Tomasat for a few years, and then on to Wisconsin. How did Wisconsin environment, a Southeast Asian Studies program, shape you as a scholar? Did it move you towards Thailand? Did it more, or look at it in different ways? Did it expand how you thought about it? Because you started also to uh, be also more involved in, in Asian studies as well, which led, of course, to your role in a the AAS. I'm a kind of move along with my environment, with condition, uh, like even where I did history. Of course, I, I try to make the best out of it, but let's say I don't have a kind of big plan. My big plan, I have to say a moment ago, and I still have that kind of in my idea, I want to disrupt before the age of disruption becomes a common word. <laughs> I want to disrupt Thai historical ideology. That's all my, what, my politics. <laughs> I want to do something that make people don't believe. And that later I, I kind of crystallized my idea, understand better too that the purpose, in my view, the purpose of history as a knowledge, the purpose of humanity is just try to make things that sacred, not sacred. Try to make things that sounds inviolable, irrational, exports it, irrational, the exports it, Funny side exposes. Let's say make people not to believe it easily. That's why I go to map because people thought it's natural, right? Then they, you can think about other things by yourself. But uh, that's that's my idea. Anything sacred is not sacred. It's just it's under side. I love Wisconsin. The first time I didn't think about going. My horizon of my Thai. Most Thai scholars at the time is finished PhD, going back home, teaching there, done. So they gave me opportunity. I present my work. In fact, what you asked me from the beginning, oh, are you activists? In Thailand, they should know the other side. <laughs> because they, they, they look at me as activists all the time instead of look at me as scholars. Yeah, a lot of details I can tell you if you're interested, but maybe you don't. I was treated as scholars even up to, up to now. My people in my generation still treat me or look me first as, a, as an activist rather as scholars, suspicious of me, of my idea, before knowing what I did, that kind of thing. In Wisconsin, it's the opposite. I have to tell them my background because I don't want to, to keep it a secret. They say, oh, they move on talking about maps. <laughs> they don't care about my politics. They know it. They do care. But not caring in the sense of, no, they didn't recruit me of the... Have you heard of the name John Van Sina, who wrote about oral history? Africanist. I remember he's the chair of the recruiting committee. I kind of... I was... the. All the things we talk, it doesn't mean he's, he's non-political. No, no, he's, he knows that. But he talks to me about map. He talks to me about post-structuralism. He talks to me about history and concept. After knowing my background, he still doesn't care much. <laughs> As you talk, I love that. In a way, I, I don't mean that I deny or I, I hate my activist background. No. But by that time, I developed the... The, the other side. I didn't tell people, many people. I almost quit Tamasat already because Tamasat and most people in Thailand treat me as activist. They didn't give me a chance to present my work. Yes, they can present my work, but they're not interested. After presenting my work, some questions come back. How, what, what is your scholarship can serve the future of Thailand? which I don't care, it's just supposed to be useless Why you ask this question. <laughs> so I, I, I can't find my, I can't find, I, I don't have fun. I don't have fun with scholarship. I don't deny activist political aspect, I, I, but it, 
It's not the only way. So I almost quit at Tamasa after two years. I look, I look for a job already. Since people treat me as activist, I want to be activist. Then it's easy. Wisconsin gave me opportunity. People in Central Southeast Asian Studies at Wisconsin gave me opportunity. And I have to say that 30 years after that, I still, even, even I was in Japan three years before now, and just back to Madison, finished work in Japan. Finished, I went back to Madison only two months. I know what I miss. It, it's so fun listening to talk that is useless. Talk that enjoy the brain cells. Talk that I, I have fun. I have fun thinking. I have fun in, fun in the, same, in the serious ways. And that I, I told my people that I was lucky. I'm the kind of people that, no, I'm not that smart. I have, if you know, people like Cassian, my friend, my good friend, he's a real smart, <laughs> real genius. Um, I need to be in good condition. Wisconsin provide me good condition to grow. If I were in Thailand, I would be a dead wood. I would be, would have stopped my academic, my intellectual life because I'm not that good. That yearn for something, go for something. Only condition, I don't mean in Wisconsin alone, maybe other places, but let's say in my case, just I was lucky to be in the right condition. It's stimulating. It, again, they know my politics, but they don't care. <laughs> they don't care. They never ask me to do anything politically. They ask me since uh, they know that I they, they are not going to recruit another Southeast Asianist, put it that way, in, in Wisconsin. They put me in the search committee almost every year, and I enjoy that. I love it. I love it. Reading dissertation, reading books by other people, and comments. And they found that, it turned out they found that I, they like my comments, they like my service that way, I, and I enjoy it. So nighttime is my time to read newspapers in Thailand. Some spare time is my time to write articles from time to time. But I believe that I spend 100% time for my service uh, as a faculty there. And, and it's mutual because I love that. I love that life. Did your time at Wisconsin um, have an effect on the new book that um, will be coming out? Uh, in March. This is infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> if you read beginning section, I, the making of this book, you know that. In the mid-90s, there is memory, the wave of memory studies, right? Mid-90s, because of World War II, 50th anniversary of World War II, of Holocaust. That's the time that I follow the stream. I learn what they do and I think about my experience. Uh, that influenced me to start thinking about the massacre as a memory project. I start from there. It's in the book that what I did in the 90s that I, I thought that I would stop there because I have, my interest at the time is something else. For October 6th, my interest is it's not academic. Put it that way, it's not academic, it's more my personal political mission. But uh, that environment helped me think a lot about it. Even after I finished one article, then I was encouraged to think about as a bigger project, as a book. It takes me time, too long, but let's say for me it, it, it's okay. It just part part of it is part of my development too. Not just not just how many years in the in, as a project as for publication is 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 part of me. When uh, by by now memory studies die down, not many people care anymore, but it's fine. I yeah, the influence is is that environment interest in memory studies. Listen to a lot of talk, read a lot of books about in memory studies. 
and form my own idea. And finally, what has led you to your, or could you tell us something about your most recent research involving the law? How have you turned, in a sense, to the law? In fact, sign map can go different ways. I go certain ways that people may not go, but that, that's my choice. Like last, I mean, two weeks, a few weeks, 10 days ago, people work on, they, they took this as sign map inspired them to work on art, which surprised me. I have, I have no idea what art is. <laughs> so I'm interested in that. That way they take it as a kind of, they think further as an art, which I still don't understand how they can do it. But let's say I, I joined a project partly because I want to know how they did it. <laughs> And by now, I'm still not quite understand. My colleagues at Wisconsin treat the book because map and geobody brought them to blah, 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 blah. I understand to some extent, but always. The first, among the first book that takes I map seriously is on, is uh, Raymond Crabb on Mexico. He taught at, he is teaching at Cornell right now in Latin America. When he said, talk to me, when he said manuscript to me, I have to say that I don't understand how he applied it. <laughs> he applied his own way. People in Thailand take it differently. For me, first and foremost, Sai Map is alternative Thai historical narrative. In fact, I didn't answer the previous question. If you read carefully, I can brag that. I can brag, yes, because I, many parts of it, I, I, didn't con I was not conscious. Many parts I was conscious. I hide a lot in that book. I hide mm -hmm. a lot of implications. You can read the book. This is what I learned from, 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 from a now school. You can read the book in different ways. Of course, many books can read in different ways, but in this case, intentionally. You read a history of map, then you find history of map. You read the whole thing as an allegory. You find another story. Yes, it's my intention. I think about it, the whole thing as an allegory. Then what I have in the real story is me. Don't worry, you find your, your story, because my friend used to try, and he saw, found one story. He told me what his story he found is. I told him it's different from mine. <laughs> you can read your own ways. The overarching things, one way, one way of it, those are the ways I didn't go. Those are the ways that other people read. The way I go is simple, conventional history, history of transformation to modernity. That's why people try to urge me to move on, to carry it on the map. I didn't go. A kind of resistance. Not because I don't think those are important. Not, not because of that. It's just because I have in my mind, I want to go different directions. I want to look at other aspects of modernity. Over the time after map, by the way, because map is easier. If I study transformational historical consciousness, it's too much too. My dissertation, my thesis, in fact, have chapter eight. Not different, whole chapter eight, which my advisor, Craig, told me, drop it out. <laughs> because it makes the, the thesis incoherent. And think about it further. Yes, over time, I wrote three or four articles, including the articles about Gosoro Gulab to Mauricio here, that I thought about it since I did dissertation that is part of the project on transformation of historical knowledge. I wrote three or four articles, but I didn't finish a monograph. I have my overall project, transformation to modernity, what I mean, what are the basic components, five, six, seven, I have, yeah, I have six a component. Geography, the easiest one done, the more difficult history, three or four articles done. I have in my idea, three or four articles because different aspect of history. I have my idea, the transformation of the religious, uh, it's, it's all intellectual history, by the way. 
it's all intellectual history, but different aspect. One is about religion, like when Buddhism stopped being the religion to become a religion, right? Partly because you have to have comparative. Uh, sense of religion. I finished that article, but the, th the two or three articles that I didn't finish is that I haven't even started. The way Buddhism is understood entirely in modern time, we have to understand is otherness, superstition. What is superstition is defined by what is Buddhism and vice versa. And if you know Weber, you know Durkheim, religion and secularism is almost like a binary opposition. I think most in Asia there is no such a binary opposition. No. At least in Thailand, you have to figure out the relationship between tripartite, Buddhism, superstition, and science. You have to figure out what are their relationship. That's another project. Law is another project. Law is another project because I think, I believe that based on Buddhism, Thai concept of society, also normal society, is an organic society. I think many, many of us may think about Singapore that way too. It's organic society, which is different components have to work in harmony, right? That's the a, that's a way Thai. That's why in Thailand that harmony is translated into hierarchy into certain places where people belong. We have to know in Thai, the higher and the lower place. In the end, not just the high and low, know the place, know your function. Then there have two projects based on, I mean, try to explain the Thai concept, Thai understanding of organic society in Buddhist way. One is a common word in Thailand Maybe I'm not sure how to translate to English. The Thai is na thi. You talk about na thi, na thi all the time. Na thi is function or duty. You have to know your duty. If you, you don't talk about right, you talk about your function, your na thi. It means your place with first certain function in that place. That sense is not just Thai, it's Sanskrit. It's Sanskrit, it's Dhammasatra. Dhammasatra in Hindu, in Buddhist, more than 50% talk about where is your place? Where is your place? Law, treatise of law in Hindu Buddhist tradition is, 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 is law means social order, right? But social order in Hindu Buddhist society is the same as religious order. It's not separate, it's the same. Only become, Thailand become, I don't know, I don't want even to use the word secular. But I, I, can't, I don't have other words. Use it. Once you become secular, even though it's not real secularism, that sense separation, or let's say change, into laws, which means law is not entirely, in fact, it's not really secular. But at the same time, it's no longer religious as Tamasatra, as the, in a way, it's about social relations. When I talk about social relation, organic society, I have to study two parts. One part is the, is the importance of nati, of function or duty in Thai concept, which has to explain in the context of organic society. On the other hand, I, I think, and, and, and up to now I think it's still correct, but I'm not sure, I don't see the big picture yet. I only study certain part about legal history finished uh, I just, the publisher just told me 200 page in Thai, but not even hit to my target point. And the target point is that, what is law? Law is social relations, codify social relations, right? What is law? Codify relationship between the state and people, right? If you're public law, state, people. If you're civil law, people, among themselves. Law is, a, in simplest term, too simplistic, but let's say it's a codified relationship, social relationship. No, I'm not going to read every, every article of the law to translate into the social relations, but let's say something, some aspect of it, of legal history, should be the way to understand how organic society is in the Thai case. We look forward to 
reading what, the, what you come up with with law. I'd like to extend the conversation to the audience. 